Thank you for joining us. Here at BLC, our purpose is helping people discover and develop a life in Christ. Now here is Pastor Gary Tony. We are in part two of Canaan. Now how many of you were here last week? See, Canaan represents this new thing that God is going to take you into. And the thing that you see about this journey, man, the children of Israel, now, now let me encourage you, when you go and you read this story, uh, make a note here, write this down, Numbers 13 and 14. Okay, thank you, Michaela, I got one writing it down. I, I'm just kidding. I know some of you are brilliant, you'll remember that. But I have to write stuff down. But when you have time, okay, do me a favor and go read Numbers 13 and 14 because what you're going to see after our talk today is you're going to see some New Testament insight into some things that took place there. Because if you'll reflect back, God actually prophesied this to Abraham first. This is your land. But the children of Israel, much like us today, they are hard-headed stubborn, dare I say, rebellious people. <clears throat> you ever met anyone like that? Yeah. Saw them this morning in the mirror? Yeah. <clears throat> so let today's talk inspire you because there are things in the New Testament church that God uses Canaan to show us. See, that's what Canaan really, it really represents new, something new that God has for you. And when you read it, don't think so much geographical. I don't really necessarily want to go to Canaan in person. My promised land is in the pages of the book. There are things that God has promised me, things that God has promised you, and they, those will look different in the, the boundaries of the journey of our faith. And so learn from Canaan. Paul, in, the, in his letter to the Corinthians, I told you this last week, he says that these things were, were written for our admonition. Now that word, it doesn't just mean instruction, it also means warning. There are things they did that you do not want to do. But how many of you, you still do stuff you didn't want to do? Yeah. Let's, let's get into it. Numbers 13, verse 1, and the Lord spoke to Moses. So pay attention because this is what God said to Moses, the pastor, the prophet of that day. And he said, send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving the children of Israel. Now understand something. If God said he's given it to you, he's given it to you. There are things that you, you, you got to get this number one lesson today. There are promises. There are things that God has said he's given you and you're not seeing them. You're not walking in them yet. But God said they're yours. So calm down. We get so negative when we don't get our... You know, this is one of the big ones. I know I remind you guys of this all the time, but one of the things I've learned over the years as a pastor is this. We're all faith giants when things are going good. And, and usually, I'm telling you, as we grow in this, we do pretty good in storms. But you let, Ronnie, you let somebody not get their way. I mean, the devil will show up in a born-again believer and, and use language they don't... Because they didn't get their way. And I'm talking to y'all. All right? I'm your shepherd. What's that mean? What are you trying to say? You talking about me? Yeah, I'm talking about you. We've done that stuff. I've seen y'all act that way. I've acted that way. Don't get your way. See what's happening? Here's, here's the danger when you, get, when you get used to getting your way. And then all of a sudden you don't. Chris, man. It's rough, Right? See, the thing that God wants us to understand today as we step out of our comfort zone, see, the children of Israel, you got to get the picture here. They were in bondage. They were slaves in, a, in, in Egypt. And they had gotten used to being a slave. As a matter of fact, there's a generation of the people that got set free in Egypt. That's the only life they ever knew was slavery. Now, now, now don't think dumb stuff that today's world tries to teach you. That, that story simply represents the bondage of the old life you were in. Before you met Jesus, th that's the only life you knew. You got that? And I know you may have thought you were something, you may have had some success, but when you meet, meet Jesus, he's introducing something new. He's introducing a Canaan to you that's going to turn your world upside down, but you're going to have to trust to do it his way. 
He said, you go spy out the land, and he picked 12 leaders to go check it out. See, Canaan is this promised land. One of the things that I like to look at when you look at this story, Canaan literally represents kingdom of God living on this planet. Cities they didn't build. Houses full of stuff they didn't fill. Wells they didn't dig. Vineyards they didn't plant. He's going to take them into this good land full of good stuff. How's that translate to your life today well it'll be different for each of us but unless you're willing to take the steps you're going to be just like the children of Israel and you'll find yourself wandering in life in the desert just like they did until they died there because they refused to believe God see Canaan shows us it's this new life God has for us a life that sometimes in the natural man it looks bigger it looks intimidating if you will and sometimes he wants us to take that step to trust him A valuable lesson we can all take away from Numbers 13 is this, and we touched on this last week, the way way God's people saw themselves influenced their future. And I can tell you over the years as a pastor in my own journey of faith, because guys, real quickly, let me just remind you of some of my story, because I didn't meet Jesus till later in life. I was 30, what is it, 32? I was 32. And then the Lord sent me back to college at 32. Now, I know today, you, like I've said before, you can go to college at home with your computer in your pajamas. But back then, you actually had to go to the campus. And I was the old guy. I mean, I'm running around with 19 and 20-year-olds. You know, and I'm, I, was, I was Papa all then, Ricky. Yeah. <laughs> I was the old dude at school. And so, so God's already humbling me and teaching me some of these things. And so I graduate and I get back in, I get out in the real world of ministry and I'm older. And I got all these young people that I'm looking at that are having these successful churches and the devil is wearing me out. Yeah, yeah you should have, could have, would have, and all that nonsense. Don't let the enemy mess with you, okay? Why am I telling you that? Because the way you see yourself. See, it took me some time to get my feet wet and get some, some foundation under me to get a little confidence. Like, you know what? God, God's not looking at my age. He's looking at my yes, Lord. <clears throat> yeah? I believe with some of the things we have today is because Tracy and I, we're just crazy enough to say, okay, you got it. Let's go. Going into Canaan, right? See, Joshua and Caleb, they show us this kind of attitude, this faith attitude, trusting in God's promise armed with their faith they they said stuff like let's go right now the lord is with us let's go you know jesus made it clear when you follow the life of jesus in his famous sermon on the mountain in matthew 7 jesus makes this statement and i've thought about this for years and tried to interpret different things into it but he says this narrow is the gate listen to me this morning a lot of people want to fit that into some religious philosophy Narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way that leads to life. See, a lot of Christians, they get enough of a revelation of Jesus to miss hell. You could get born again, but stepping into your God-ordained life, discovering your Canaan moments in the promised land that God has for you, it's not going to be, it's not going to be the way of the world. Guys, two, only two out of the 12 that were sent in actually believed God. The majority were were governed by the things that they saw. And the thing is, those leaders, unfortunately, the the, the ten unbelieving leaders, they influenced the rest of the congregation. Now, if you go on to study that story, those ten, God killed all of them with a plague. Ow. Like, God killed them? God killed them. (laughs) Is he going to kill me with a plague? No. No, this is the new covenant, all right? You need to understand when you read the New Testament, you, or the Old Testament, you always have to look at it through new covenant principles. Otherwise, you wind up being one of those goofy, out of balance Christians that try to teach a bunch of Old Testament stuff. Got quiet because you might be sitting here today. We love you. <laughs> you have to read the old through the new. 
because you're born again. That old covenant doesn't exist anymore, so you have to learn faith lessons from them, but you're no longer under the law. But the Bible makes it clear that that, that group of 10 leaders came back and influenced everybody, and the, major, the majority led them a different way. And that group, they didn't get the promised land. And what's, what's really crazy is Joshua and Caleb had to put up with that mess. And I personally, the, the Bible doesn't go into detail about Joshua and Caleb's life in the wilderness. But I, I, I believe that God's hand was on them the whole time. The favor of the Lord was on them. I'm sure those, that unbelieving bunch, they didn't like them. I'm going to show you some stuff in a minute. But remember, we made this statement last week. Our inheritance is in direct proportion to our identity. Our inheritance is in direct proportion to our identity. Your, your Canaan land, your promises from God, you got to know who you are in Christ. You need to know that you are a son or daughter of God. You're not somebody begging God to do something for you. God's already paid the price for you. That's why Jesus said, it is finished. I have established a new way of life for you. But that way of life is narrow in this, on this side of heaven. And it's not legalistic and religious. It's a different way of living. You try to take a fish out of water and see how long it lives. That's what his point is in the New Testament. To walk in the spirit. To be a spiritual person, not a religious person. To be a spiritual person, not a religious person. I know I say that all the time, but I am telling you, this is one of the biggest things that I deal with as a pastor. We are so bound up in religion. Just like the children of Israel couldn't let go, they couldn't let go of Egypt. Bunch of y'all, you can't let go of your denominational stuff you was raised with. Yeah. See, Canaan is all about a new life. And the thing is, you cannot experience Canaan while you're trying to hold on to Egypt. Because he... As, Andy, as crazy as it was, they were slaves, but they were used to Egypt. They were used to be, I mean, they had their, the Bible says they had their vegetables, they had their, you know, uh, whatever food they had, and then they had their taskmaster. But they were used to that. You can get used to anything. Yeah. And even though God's people, they had been delivered, God brought them out. And what's crazy? Y'all, y'all read the story, the Red Sea split stuff? Yeah, I've seen dumb stuff on, on different channels. They try to explain how they, well, it was a certain time of season and it was, the, it was where the tide went away and there was a high piece of ground. And they, yeah, uh, over a million people crossed in that. It's, it is amazing what people will try to do to manipulate stuff so that they don't have to believe a miracle. I'm talking about people that are supposedly born again. Like, what's wrong with you? Why would you try to defend your unbelief? But, but we do. And so, even though they had been delivered, they had seen so many miracles during that time where God brought them out. When you read the psalmist, the psalmist says that God brought them out with silver and gold. It actually says in the old King James, the Bible says that the children of Israel spoiled the Egyptians. Now, grandparents, that doesn't mean like you spoil your grandkids today. I was talking in the, in the lobby with Linda, and she said, oh, isn't, isn't Michaela beautiful? She's the best girl ever. <laughs> well, uh, well, of course, uh, mom's going to say, well, yes. <laughs> and then I said, I said, until she starts acting like her mom, that's what I told you. <laughs> but that's not the kind of spoiling I'm talking about. They went in and took everything, and the Egyptians said, please take it, just get out of here. I'm tired of your frogs, I'm tired of the, the flies, I'm tired of all the plagues, just go. The Bible says that they, they left with all the silver and the gold, and there was not a feeble one among them. What God do? He restored them. That's a picture of what he will do for us. They saw all that, and then they see an ocean split. I know we're cool with that today. Like, oh yeah, it's a great story, man, the ocean split. Yeah. You ever seen that? Right. But three days after that, say three days. This is, this is humanity for you. With the assistance of the kingdom of darkness, they start complaining. I mean, like three days. You at least give the Lord a week, Cody, before you start griping. But no. See, guys, even though God had brought them out of Egypt, getting Egypt out of them, man, it's the same today. How many of y'all got stuff that the Lord's still working on you, trying to get it out of you? <laughs> You've been packing that. Some of you hold on tight to it. Tommy, oh. yeah. 
Yeah. See, this is the thing. They, they, this blows my mind when you start getting into it and you get into Numbers 14, all the congregation, because they're, they're, they're tore up, and all the congregation lifts their voice and starts to complain about God and about Moses. And now, now remember, <clears throat> they made this statement, wouldn't it have been better? Because they're, they're, they're mad and they're comp- I, but now we, we do the same thing, so don't, don't point fingers. But we complain to, to God about stuff. How many of y'all complain about the preacher? <laughs> yeah. That was, that was my wife there. Yes, she does. But they're, they're, they're griping because they're in this wilderness situation and God showed them this new land and in their minds because the ten told them we can't do it, now we're stuck in this desert and we're wandering and we don't have any food, we don't have any way to, to do anything. I know God gave us all the gold and silver, but there's not a Walmart in the desert, so, you know. And so in, in Numbers chapter 14, verse 4, then they say this, this is their brilliant deacon board. Let's get a new leader. I'm tired of what that preacher's saying. Let's get a new preacher. Quiet in here today. <laughs> Listen, I've, I've got a dear friend. He pastored. He, I, as, as long as I knew him, he pastored the same church. And then a group wanted to change things. And they all got together and decided we, we're going to vote him out. Yeah, and a congregation got rid of the man of God that was called to that place. Listen, it happens all the time. I got, I've got pastors that I talk to, and I'm like, what in the world? That can't happen here. Now, you can leave. I'm not leaving. <laughs> I love you. you. You can vote all you want. I'll get the door for you. I'm not, I started it. I'll leave here when I leave here with it. Or I'll turn it over to somebody. And then some of you may not agree with that. Okay. Nowhere in the Bible does God call a group of people to lead. He puts a man of God in that place. And all those people, go read the story and then you can come back and talk to me about it if you don't agree with it. Okay? Yeah. And here's the thing. Right in the middle of this. As they start to gripe to God and complain about Moses, Moses and Aaron hit the ground and start praying. Why? Because they know what's coming. Don't touch God's anointing. They know, they, and, and they're praying. And Joshua and Caleb, they're like, hold up. Hey, guys, let's stop. So let's go. Listen to Numbers 14, 9. Don't rebel against the Lord. Joshua and Caleb, they're preaching now. Don't rebel against the Lord for... You know, or fear the people, for they're our bread. Their protection has departed from them. Watch this. And the Lord is with us. Man, it didn't didn't look like it. It looked scary, you know. And all the congregation is going against Joshua and Caleb, and they, they they want to vote Moses out. Now watch this. And all the congregation, say congregation. All the congregation said, let's, let's stone them. In other words, let's kill Joshua and Caleb. We, we, we done with voting them out. Let, let's just kill them. <laughs> huh? And the Bible says that the glory of the Lord appeared, and it began to speak. And he, his power was released there against those people. Man. See, Joshua and Caleb had a revelation the rest of God's people never got. And the harsh reality is, just like, no, no, I love y'all, right? Just like only two out of 12 got the revelation, those same manipulating, deceiving spirits influence the church today. And we, found, we, we find ourselves being frozen in fear and unbelief, not wanting to step where God has told us to. So I want to show you something about 
leaving Egypt and stepping into the newness of what God has for you. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is teaching, and you have to understand, there is no church yet. No one is born again yet, and he's dealing with uh, the disciples of John the baptizer and he's dealing with the Pharisees and they are, they've all been raised up under the law and they're living under this legalistic way of life. And Jesus begins to teach this lesson in Mark chapter 2 verse 19. He says this, can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they can't fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them and then in those days they could fast. Because they were, remember the Pharisees, they were, they were, they were you know, quizzing Jesus, really not, they were really trying to trap him in something. Because they do all these different legalistic fasts. They're serious about fasting. And now make no mistake, the New Testament teaches that we are to fast. But you need to understand the lesson here. Let me have that back, Derek, that one in Mark. Oh, come on, yeah, keep on going back up a little bit. There we go. Let me look at that for a second. Because what happens here, as he begins to talk about fasting, you understand Jesus is he's trying to prove a point to them about while he's with them. He's, you understand, they're not going to, the wedding party's here, man. We got a party going on. We're not fasting right now. They're, they're enjoying me. I'm with them. Okay? Now, Jesus, the Son of Man, left the planet. But Christ, the Son of God, lives where? In us. We are sons and daughters of God today. So I don't believe Jesus was saying that they didn't fast. They didn't fast in that legalistic sense that they're trying to drive home here today. They still separated themselves from God. And when you look to the book of Acts, you see that, they, well, they definitely fasted. But it has to be a spirit-led fast in your life because the Spirit of God lives inside you. They're, they're, you know, it, it, now, if you want to do a few days or something, that's great. If you want to do something lengthy, if the, if the Lord tells you to do it, that's great. But over the years, I've learned this, and Brother Hagin used to teach us this all the time. God would much rather you live a fasted life. Yeah, you can punish your body if you want to, and you might get a revelation because you got quiet. But, it, but according to the book of Romans, them that are led by the Spirit of God, I think God can tell you something if you're dialed in without you torturing your body. Now, I'm not saying, now, once again, the book of Acts makes it clear that we are to have those moments where we separate. And you tell your flesh, no burger for you today, Jesus. <laughs> See, a lot of people don't even know what to do. When, it, when they fast, you just go without food? Well, that's called a diet. <laughs> yeah, that, no. That, and they don't really work. <laughs> no, you have to, you, when you separate, separate for him, Okay. Now, I'm getting sidetracked. That's not my point today. Because Jesus is teaching something here about separating from that old life. You see, Jesus, when he came, he replaced fasting with feasting. He replaced our, the sackcloth and ashes with the robes of righteousness. He replaced the spirit of heaviness with the garment of praise. He replaced the law with grace. And then he gives this revelation as he's talking, because I know some people, they want to teach that Jesus, verses uh, 19 and 20 are one lesson, and verses 21 and 22 are a different lesson. No, they're not. He's talking about the same thing after he's talking about you fasting and when it's time to do it and when it's not time to do it. And then he, then he says this. He gives this revelation to them because he's trying to prove to us how we're going to live this new, how will you go into Canaan? And then he says this. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment or else the new piece pulls away from the old and the tear is worse I remember when I was growing up we were poor actually po we could only afford the p and the o we were you know and so I had jeans that I had of course now today holy jeans is cool I mean everybody wearing holy jeans but back then no you, and, and you know she couldn't buy me new ones so she would sew them up and how many of Peggy, you remember, where's Peggy at? Peggy, you remember iron-on patches? <laughs> well, I mean, but the minute she washed them, it tear away again. What's God saying? You can't take a new piece of cloth and sew it on some old blue jeans. Because once the wear and tear, once the washing takes place, it tears again. 
Can't put the new, can't mix the two. And then he says this, and no one puts new wine in an old wineskin or else the new wine bursts the wineskin and the wine is spilt and it's ruined. New wine has to be put in a new wineskin. Guys, the whole point of Canaan is you have to leave Egypt. You got to leave it. You can't mix the two, but I am telling you, we have all been guilty of it. We want to mix the two. Troy, we want to mix the two, man. We want a little bit of the world. We want a little bit of Friday night, a little bit of Sunday morning. <laughs> What's that mean, Pastor? You know what it means. Quit trying to be all spiritual up in here. You know exactly what it means, you. you. <laughs> what are you saying? I can't have fun on Friday? No, I'm not saying that, but quit trying to mix the two. Quit trying to mix it. You, you, you have a new way of living. And to get to this place, and it's never legalistic, it's never religious. But here's, the, guys, the danger with putting something new on something old, many times, at first, it might seem like it works. I remember when mom, she'd iron that patch on my jeans, I could, I could wear them to school again. And then by the end of the day, it doesn't come off. Yeah, you stand there with your, with your underwear showing because they told her, like, <laughs> mom. Now, I know that's cool. In today's school, yeah, that's cool. Oh, yeah, let my underwear show. But it's really not cool. Y'all just think you something in your mind. It's... But back then, it was embarrassing, you know. Like, Mom, what are you doing to me? See, you can't mix them. That's his whole point. And sometimes when you try, in the beginning, it looks like, oh, it's okay. I can mix it. I can do both. Huh? I can have a little business in the front and party in the back. Like some of y'all with your, with your, I, I can't, I can't do both. I can only do, I can grow the party in the back, but I can't grow nothing in the front. So I don't know what you'd call that. A mess is what you'd call it, right? See guys, we will never get to this place of experiencing Canaan when we're continually trying to hold on to some of those old things. And, and, and here's the deal. When you look at the church today, there's a lot of us in this room wonderfully saved, love Jesus going to heaven, but some of your old stuff, you're still packing it around, man. Some of your old traditions, some of your old habits, you're still trying to lug that stuff around, and God's trying to take you into something new. Let me ask you this. How many of you all, would you be honest to, to self-evaluate for a minute and say, you know what, I got some old stuff I'm, I'm, I'm trying to put on God's new. Let me rephrase it. How many of you, 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 you want to hang on to your old stuff and then step out and do your own thing and then ask God to bless it? You didn't ask God what he wanted to do. Just me? Thank you. Okay, thanks, Annie. I'll come. Yeah. See, this is something that God's first group to go into Canaan, they couldn't get it because they refused to believe God. They refused to trust him. What did he say? I have given you the land. Go get it. Now, here's the thing. They, Jack, they still had to go get it. See, a lot of Christians today, we're just waiting on God to do it. Well, when God does it, if it's God's will, when God, when God, what about when you? See, they refused to let go of Egypt, and it hindered them from seeing themselves according to what God said they were. Remember? Grasshoppers in their own sight. See, at the end of the day, our identity, it can't be found in the things of this world. You're a new, you're a new creation in Christ. This is why our inheritance, just like the first Israelites, is directly in proportion to our identity. you got to start seeing yourself in Christ. Not religion, not denomination, not victory life. you got to see yourself like him. And I know, I get this, many think Canaan seems in, to some degree unachievable. I, I talk to people as a pastor all the time, and they, they think that Christianity stuff is really kind of unrealistic, unnecessary. That's kind of like what Jesus did for us, right? I mean, think about it. A dude that really wasn't a dude at the time, was part of the Trinity, came to planet Earth in the womb of a woman and became a human. What? And then he died, and then he rose again. And now in his human body, he lives in heaven. And, and what he accomplished at the cross is he made all you got to do, all you got to do, Seth, is just believe it. And you get to participate in this life, but you got to believe it. But that's 
far out there, Gravy. That's some unre unrealistic stuff, man. See, at the end of the day, the only thing that keeps God's people from going into Canaan is unbelief. And it's the same today. Stepping into the new things that God has for you, you actually have to believe this stuff. Remember I shared this scripture with you last week out of Romans chapter 5. Because of our faith, Christ, say Christ, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege. He's already put you there. Well, it doesn't look like it to me. Well, listen, have you read the Bible? There's times it didn't look like it to some of those guys too. I'm sure Paul and Peter, some, I mean, they're, some of the struggles they faced. Silas hooks up with Paul and winds up getting beat with sticks and thrown in jail. Yeah. So often we, we conclude that what we see determines the reality of who God is. And that's why they couldn't go into Canaan. He says, because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand. And we confidently, and this might help somebody today, and joyfully, confidently and joyfully, we look forward to sharing in God's glory. See, guys, but only Jesus brings us to this place. You got that? You'll never be good enough to get this. That's not how you get it. You have to believe it. You have to believe that he is in you, that he is anointing you, that he is empowering you, that he is helping you to separate your life so that you can do the things he's called you to do. You have to believe that he's going to give you the strength having done all to stand. You're going to be able to stand when it doesn't seem like it's going right. And what's really cool is when you know that Jesus is in your corner with you. I want you to listen to this. This will help some of you this morning. And, and this is Jesus praying for us in the Gospel of John. Now, you check this out. In John 17, in your study, you can go, well, John 17 is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. But Jesus is praying, and he says this, I have given them your word. Now, see, it would be like today, somebody coming up, like one of your children, like, Dad, I gave them your, I, I gave them your word, man. You said you was going to do it. I gave them your word. See, the reason that we struggle with that today, because a lot of times our word doesn't mean anything. And that's why we find ourselves wavering in an unbelief because we think the, that our, the way we are is the way God is. I have given, he's talking to the Lord. This is Jesus praying to the Father for us. I have given them your word. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world. What's he talking about? We're not of the world and what are we of? New world. Huh? You are of that new wine. That new life. You're a new creation. That's Jesus' point when he was telling Nicodemus, man, you've got to be born again. And Nicodemus was trying to process things with his human intelligence. It's a spiritual. Your spirit is born again. Listen, my flesh didn't get born again. Because I can tell you right now, if my flesh got born again, I'd be 6'4", chiseled. And I have, I, I mean, I, I, I have some serious hair. I lost a six-pack six pack a long time ago, Billy. I got me a kegger. <laughs> yeah. I know. He said, I've given, listen, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they're not of the world, just as I am not of the world. He says, I don't pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not, now this is, this is, he, he, he says it again for a reason, they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. And then he says this, so Father, sanctify them, set them apart by your truth. Your word is truth. You see, the way you come out of Egypt is by the word of God and you meditate it and the seed of the word of God gets in you and transformation begins to take place in your spirit. And then the next thing you know, some of those old things you used to do, you used to rely on, you no longer do because you are becoming this new creation that God made you to be. You're discovering your Canaan. But if you never take the time to allow God to sanctify you by his word, you'll never see this. You'll never be able to step into your Canaan because you don't believe it. It hasn't transformed your thinking to the degree that you can take a step of faith. Because faith comes from hearing stuff like this. And then verse 18, then he says this. Now remember, this is Jesus talking to the Father. 
about us. And he says, as you sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. Now, how did God send Jesus into the world? Acts 10, 38. How God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and power. And he went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. See, this is the thing. God's with you. This ought to be one of your faith confessions every morning. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Lord has anointed me to do good, to heal the sick, to preach the gospel, to set them at liberty that have been held captive. Huh? It ought to be your confession of faith. You ought to be believing God for this stuff. Because why? You are no longer of this world. You are a new creation in Christ. But here's the thing. Because of the way God made us, you have to understand, he designed it this way on purpose. The power of the gospel will work in any human that will hear it. Our problem is we're still too busy looking at the outside of something. Lord, I've been preaching to them for years. Quit looking at what you see and trust in the fact that you've been sowing the seed of the kingdom of heaven into their life. Hearing and accepting and then acting on something, that's how you became a righteous, that's how you got born again. See, and then God gives us this very simple guideline in the New Testament for believers. The just shall live by faith. You're built to live this way. Your spirit man it may not make sense all the time. Going into Canaan made no sense. Living by faith is something that you're built to do. But you have to learn how to live by faith. Your intelligence, your soul, if you've got a bunch of baggage, if, you still, if you're still so consumed with Egypt, you're going to struggle with this because you're still trying to process things. You know, it's, it's like when the Lord puts it on your heart to give. I mean, you guys, uh, I'm telling you, you are such wonderful givers. Our church is so blessed. And we don't even get up here and preach to you about giving. And you just give. Yeah. So thank you for that. But you remember the day when you didn't give? Come, come on, some of you are like, oh, no, I've always been that way. <laughs> yeah, you have. <laughs> that ain't true. <laughs> but I'm just talking about simple little things of obedience. You remember the first time you shared the gospel with someone? Stepping out and trusting that the Lord is leading you in these things. See, this is how we're built to live is by faith. Colossians chapter 2, you've heard me say this hundreds of times. Verse 6, so then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him. The way you get in is how you live in. What'd you, how'd you get in? Come on, there's only one way you get in. you got to believe it in your heart and do what? Yes. Only one way in. You will ne on your, you, you'll never be good enough. One way. And Paul says, writing to the New Testament church, the same way you got in is how you lived that life in, in Christ. See, you think about it, just like Joshua and Caleb, what if we actually started living our lives with total reliance and confidence on God when he tells you to do something? Yeah, but God, that doesn't make sense. Huh? After all, he did tell us that we are to live by faith, not by sight. Yeah? The Amplified says it like this. We live our lives with a confident belief in God's promises. See, your promised land today is in the confines of that book, not a location. What promise do you have from God that you're standing on today? Do you even have one? See, Canaan was a real place. It wasn't an imaginary place. For you to step into some of the, your Canaan land moments, you got to be real with it. It can't be just some, I'd, well, you know, I just, you know, whatever God has for me. No. It's a specific thing. Find out what it is. Is God actually asking you to live a certain way, the way you, that he's called us, to actually live by believing instead of what we see? That's what Canaan represents. I mean, think about it, guys. What if, instead of seeing Christianity as a bunch of religious, legalistic traditions, we see it as a new way of life? I know the world's not going to accept this. They're going to choke on it. But you got a new way of living. You should be believing God every day. And be on purpose about it. Not religious about it, but it's how you live. It's how you live. How many of you are going to eat something after church today? 
Why? I mean, why why you need food? What's well, how we live, man? Now I know some of you do much better than others. I know you you you, you you've got such a such a grip on your diet. You're so disciplined. I'll pray for you. <laughs> but see, in in our humanity, we, we need sustenance. We need some food, right? And you're going to get some today. Listen, your spirit, man, it's built to live a certain way too. And what the Word of God will, listen, the Word of God will do for your spirit what five guys will do for your belly. <laughs> Somebody, five guys. <laughs> well, if you haven't had five guys, then you need some, you need some, you, it'll set you free, brother. <laughs> oh, yeah. Guys, think about it. What, um, what if Jesus actually meant it when he told us all things are possible to him that believes? Huh? What if he actually meant that? You think about it in Luke chapter 18, he actually makes this statement what is impossible with people? is possible with God. See, I honestly believe that God is looking for a group of people that will dare to live by their faith that he's shaping inside them. That we're, that he's looking for this group of people that's willing to leave Egypt and leave all the stuff behind and step into the unknown, step into the, to, to the strange and, and maybe even the scary, to live by faith, not by sight. You see, throughout the Bible, one thing that you repeatedly see is that God uses what appears to be an opposition to elevate his people to a higher level of success. Canaan, in the natural, there was no way. But God had already prepared a way. But they still had to step into Canaan. Still had to go, man. Remember what Joshua and Caleb said in Numbers 14? Don't rebel against the Lord. Don't fear the people of the land. They've already been given to us. They're our bread. Their protection has departed from them. The Lord is with us. Man, when you know that, you have this boldness about you. See, what if the Canaan that you're facing right now, listen to me. What if the Canaan that you're facing, that challenge, that obstacle, what if it's not there to defeat you, but to establish you? You know, I read an article one time, and it was a quote from, how many of you know who Joe Frazier is? He was the the real deal back in his day. But he said, all that work I do at 5 o'clock in the morning shows up in an hour in the ring. But he still, he still had to get in the ring, man. That's where he found out what all the work was for. See, some of you, God, are, God is, is working on you, developing some things in you right now, but you're going to have to get in the ring, man. See, what if we start talking more about how big God is instead of how big the problem is? See, when we encounter things that may look like a setback, faith turns it around for a setup for God to advance you, to step you into your Canaan. See, if we're going to discover all that God has for us, if we're going to live lives of faith, guys, you can't let the challenge, the situation, the difficulty, the disappointment, the opinions of other people influence you. Sometimes you just got to step. And I know it's easy to get relaxed. Especially, remember what we talked about last week? If you go back in Deuteronomy when God was talking about the promised land, he said, now when you get there and you're full, don't forget it was me. He, he actually tells them in Deuteronomy, you put my words on your doorpost, you put it on your gate. You talk about it when you get up, you talk about it when you go to bed, you talk about it when you get around the table. Anymore, man, Tracy and I will go out to a restaurant and, and the whole family I know you want to blame your kids. Where do you think they learned it from? I'm not about the whole family on devices. Parents, take that junk away at the dinner table. Take it away. Now, this does come with a warning because if you've allowed it for the last four years and now you're going to take it, you better be prepared for Canaan battle. (laughs) 
Huh? I hate you, Mom. Dad, you're of the devil. Yeah. Remember what Paul said, the same way we got in is how we live it. See, I don't, guys, I, I'm going to get you out of here with this. I don't think God gave us, listen carefully, I don't think he gave us these new lives in Christ just so we could coast through life till we get to heaven. Because I'm, I'm going to heaven, so I'm just going to make my money. Annie, I'm going to enjoy my blessings, my stuff. Me and Annie, we're going to play golf when we want to. I mean, if you don't, if you don't make it to heaven, at least I, I shot par on number 17. No. At some point, in the middle of all the blessings that God has given us, especially in this nation, are you for real right now? We have brothers and sisters that we will meet in heaven and they have to sneak in the middle of night to do what you do freely on a Sunday morning. They risk their lives and their families to do this. And we get mad because somebody offended us. I'm not going back to church anymore. I'm mad at people. I'm mad at God. And God's like, let me just... But he, he would never. Not in the New Testament. He loves you. Huh? See, if you're in the middle of your greatest opposition, let this talk encourage you today. Let the Spirit of God stir up a little confidence in you. Maybe you feel like you're stuck. Maybe you feel like you've missed it for the, un uh, the hundredth time. You've blown it so many times. You've messed up so many times. You feel like you've been waiting forever and you don't see a way out. Then let this challenge, let this talk stir inside you. Let Numbers 13 fire something up inside you because I have given you the land I am with you God's not finished your Canaan has been given to you it's time for you to step up and embrace those things and stop looking at the things that you're not stop walking by sight trust in the Lord remember faith chooses to accept what God tells us that he knows our end from our beginning. I love how the message paraphrases Jeremiah 29, 11. I know everybody knows Jeremiah 29, 11, but I love the message in this. God says this, I'll show up and I will take care of you as I promised. I will do it. How many of you know God tells the truth? And then he makes this radical statement. I know, Gravy, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, but God, this is uncomfortable. I don't know about this, God. Are you sure? Are you sure? I don't know about this. He said, I know what I'm doing. I got it all planned out. Plans to take care of you, not abandon you. Plans to give you the future that you hope for. But you got to do it with, you got to do it my way. And that's where, that's where we, that's where we stumble. Because God's way is not, sometimes it's not my way. I want my way. I know y'all looking all spiritual today, but I had a bunch of y'all like, I know I want it, Billy, I want it my way. Huh? But God has a better way. So what's that look like for you in your family, in your career path? You've got to step out in some of these things. But remember, you can't put a new patch on old blue jeans. You got to leave Egypt if you're going to step into Canaan. Amen. Now, if you're in the room this morning and you've never taken your first step of faith to step into God's promise of heaven being your home, of Jesus being your Savior, well, today's your day. If you're listening to me in this room, if you're watching me at some point online, whenever it is, stop what you're doing, take a second, and give thought to that, that thing that's rolling around in the back of your head. It's like, wait a minute. Is that, is that you, Lord? Yes, it's the Lord. Pull it on your heart. He's not going to show up in some burning bush experience. He's going to send a preacher into your life to give you an opportunity to say yes to that thought that he's planted inside you. So say yes today. Yeah, but I don't know if I like your church. That's okay. You won't be the first or the last, but you're here today. We're just asking you to give Jesus a chance. We'll help you find a church if you don't like ours. That's cool. But you're here today. Tomorrow is not promised to anybody. So take a step of faith with us. Say this very simple prayer as we say as a family together. And give Jesus a chance in your life. Amen. Let's all pray together. Lord Jesus, come into my life and make me new. And from this day forward, 
Jesus is my Lord. Heaven is my home. And I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you're in the room and you said that prayer, stop by the information desk. We've got a little gift for you, kind of help you in your journey of faith. Those of you listening and watching, man, you got to tell somebody. Your new journey begins today, and it'll be this, this, this wonderful experience that God will reveal himself to you, and he'll surround you with people that will help you in your journey to discover who you are in your new life, in your new Canaan, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. We love you. Have a wonderful week. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please be sure to click on the subscribe button. For more information on Victory Life Church, check us out at victorylifeky.com. Thank you so much for listening.